Bon dia, bon dia a tothom. Moltes gràcies per, per venir. Benvinguts. Aquesta és la darrera sessió del Fòrum de Recerca. So, this is the last session of the Research Forum. Uh, thank you, Veronica, for organizing this, all, all this academic year. And we have today uh, Félix Mathieu. Félix Mathieu is an old friend uh, from Quebec. Probably you know that we have a very close ties uh, between Catalonia and Quebec, between Spain and, and Canada. Uh, we have a lot of academic uh, exchanges uh, and, and connections and projects. And I think that I can say that Félix Mathieu uh, is, is part of this, uh, of this academic intellectual connection. And he's also part of a, of a school of thought on uh, diversity, on minorities, on how liberalism and liberal democracy can accommodate uh, minorities uh, within, within uh, nation states. And, and he has been uh, working on, this, on these topics uh, during his academic career. He's assistant professor of political science at uh, Winnipeg University in Manitoba in Canada. And uh, he is also a co-editor of a very important journal, the Canadian Journal of Political Science, uh, a bilingual journal, in fact, that publishes both in, in English and, and French. Um, and he has recently published uh, a couple of books. Uh, I say the titles just in case uh, you, you want to check them. Taking Pluralism Seriously, a Complex Society is Under Scrutiny. I have this, I have the volume here. Um, and also a second book on constitutionalism and diversity, Essays on Federal Democracy, co-authored with uh, Dave Gannett. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have you today, uh, Felix. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, he will tackle today a very, a very important question connected to this school of thought that I was commenting right now on, on this idea of clarity that now is also a fashionable idea uh, in, in Catalan politics or controversial idea as well. So I guess uh, Felix will give some some clarity <laughs> to the question, <laughs> taking the uh, taking the uh, the example and the case study of Canada and Quebec as as a point of departure. Thank you, thank you, Felix, for coming. Thank you, Mark. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Veronica, uh, Saskia, and Mark for putting all this together. I'm very happy to be here with you today to uh, present this ongoing research uh, past the Quebec referendum lessons from the Canadian Clarity Act in the context of uh, the Cat Catalonia-Spain debate. Uh, it is not the presentation that I had planned to do originally when I entered into a uh, relation with uh, Veronica uh, and Mark, uh, but I decided to adapt what I had planned to present today with ongoing debates here in uh, Catalonia and Catalonia and Spain uh, dynamics. So hopefully I will be able to use the example and some of the debates that have been going on in Quebec Canada dynamics to see a bit more clearly, hopefully, uh, what can be the uh, positive and potentially negative outcomes of uh, moving forward with this clarity uh, idea in the Catalan, Catalan uh, Spanish uh, debate. But before I talk about this specific research, uh, I had in mind to simply tell you a bit more about my research agenda, how it connects to what I'll be presenting today. So um, basically, my research is about diversity management, mostly regarding multinational democracies. Uh, and I connect this with federalism, both from a theoretical and a practical perspective, and with minority nations specifically. And the case of Canada is always the main case of main case study that I use, but I compare Canada with a variety of key cases, the first one being Catalonia and Spain, uh, but I've also uh, compared these cases with uh, Belgium, both Flanders and uh, Wallonia, but as well in Northern Ireland related to uh, the United Kingdom, as well as in Italy in relation to uh, South Tyrol. And I have looked at these issues both from a more empirical perspective, for instance, uh, 2021 uh, book with my colleague Evelyn Berry, we mobilized um, large-scale opinion surveys to see how Canadians relate to various institutional dynamics, what would be their preferences in terms of centralization, decentralization, symmetrical or asymmetrical treatment vis-a-vis -a, -vis a variety of public policies, of issues of public policies, and we make a series of uh, policy recommendations. That's the uh, book here. Um, or it will 
be out in English next year, hopefully uh, a divided country, identity, federalism and regionalism uh, in Canada published with the University of Toronto Press. But I've looked at this debate as well from a more theoretical and normative perspective. Uh, using constitutional politics, constitutional provisions, and look into how constitutions impact public policies, how public policies impact, impact power relations, and in turn, how these can influence uh, constitutional revisions. And I've looked into uh, a variety of cases with my book, Taking Pluralism Seriously, uh, looking mostly at how constitutions impact the uh, evolution of diversity management, looking mostly at ethno-cultural minorities or uh, immigrant minorities for the most case. And I was puzzled with the debate revolving around the so-called failure of multiculturalism. Uh, for instance, in the United Kingdom, uh, where David Cameron said that state multiculturalism had failed, I was puzzled with what this actually means in terms of public policies, but also in relation with the theory of multiculturalism uh, specifically. So I connected these uh, ongoing public debates with a presentation and a critical overview of theories of pluralism presented by Canadian scholars such as Will Kimlicka, uh, uh, James Tully, or Charles Taylor, as well as with theories advanced by uh, Tarek Modoud, uh, uh, Biku Parekh, or Anne Phillips, for instance. And in my latest book with Dave Gennett, we uh, look more at national diversity. And what we do is that we uh, updated an index that we co-developed together in 2018, the Societal Culture Index, which is an analytical tool that enables us to compare uh, what we call the institutional capacity for minority nations, uh, such as Quebec or uh, Catalonia, within the scope of their broader constitutional framework, which encompasses them. And so we look at issues related to recognition, to uh, autonomy through self-governance, looking at uh, linguistic policies, educational rights, uh, fiscal uh, arrangements, uh, but also at self-determination powers. And uh, today, actually, I first thought that I would present a chapter of that book looking into uh, constitutional provisions in Canada and Spain, looking specifically at fiscal arrangements, uh, because it's pretty interesting to look at how Spain and Canada have very similar constitutional provisions to organize uh, internal uh, wealth redistribution. In Spain, it's section 138 and 158. In Canada, it's section 36. They are very similar in their phrasing, but they produce very different outcomes uh, related to both Quebec and Catalonia. So I, that's what I thought I would present. But what happened is that I arrived here two months ago, actually day for day, and uh, I met with, uh, with Marc and he told me uh, I was uh, invited by the president of the Generalitat to chair a comedy on the clarity issue. And at first I must say, I was quite puzzled with that uh, because the Clarity Act is something that has a very bad press in Quebec, Canada dynamics. I know Marc, I've known Marc for a while. So I was like, what, what is he trying to accomplish here? And so we discussed a little bit and then I realized what was the idea and the whole uh, position here. Uh, but I said to myself, I cannot be here having this debate and not reflect on what Quebec Canada dynamics might have to say to clarify or enlighten uh, debates in other multinational democracies, say Catalonia within Spain or in Scotland regarding the United Kingdom, because in the most recent decision by the United Kingdom Supreme Court, they actually referred to the Canadians uh, Supreme Court of Canada's opinion on this very issue. So it's interesting to see how a decision by a domestic court, that of Canada, influence other multinational democracies and how they try to manage diversity. And I couldn't resist doing this also because I've actually been working on these issues for a couple of years now. Actually, in 2018, I organized a conference which led to this book, uh, Reimagining Canada Towards a Multinational uh, State, which we, we were commemorating the 20 years anniversary of what is called the Reference Race Session of Quebec, the Supreme Court of Canada's decision that precedes the Clarity Act, which is a bill that have been, has been adopted by the federal parliament in Canada in 2000 to give effect to that uh, constitutional uh, provisions. Uh, but I'll give you some context before we move into the puzzle and what I'm trying to accomplish with you today. So uh, all this follows the Quebec referendum on independence in 1995. 
which is a referendum that uh, produced a result, very, very uh, tight result, thin margin of maneuver for the, the, the unionist camp that won the referendum by a margin of basically 54,000 votes. Uh, so the yes camp won by 50.58% over the yes camp. So the very thin margin of maneuver here uh, led political elites in Ottawa to be very concerned about preserving Canadian unity, because of course, nobody wants to be the head of a government or head of state at a moment where your country could implode. And so what happened at this moment following the 1995 referendum, keeping in mind that in Quebec, there was another referendum 15 years before in 1980 that has been uh, won by the unionist camp by a margin of 60 to 40. So 15 years later, the margin was very, very limited. And so political elites in, in central Canada feared that if we were to wait another 15 years, uh, the sovereignists might actually win and Canada could explode. And so what, what are we gonna do with this? So what happened is that uh, a key political actor in Canada that was then uh, Prime Minister of Canada, Jean Chrétien, uh, decided to ask uh, the highest tribunal in Canadian, the Canadian court system, the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, to produce an opinion on something that was unclear uh, looking at the Canadian constitutional order. He asked the court the following three set, a set of three questions. So first, in Canadian domestic law, is it legal for Quebec to unilaterally secede? Second question, in international law, is it legal for Quebec to unilaterally secede? And if questions one and two conflict in the answers they would produce, which one would take precedence here? And the political motivation here behind this series of questions that the federal government asked the Supreme Court of Canada was pretty clear. Uh, it wasn't only about clarifying a constitutional issue, it was about making a political move. It was about making sure that the federal government could have the upper hand in power relations with Quebec independentists in the future. So what happened is that uh, Jean Chrétien was convinced, but absolutely convinced that the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, the highest tribunal in our court system, being traditionally quite conservative in their decision, they would say that, no, uh, Quebec cannot secede both under question one and question two. Uh, it's not possible. That's what he was certain the court would say. Uh, therefore, that would equate with his uh, need to preserve Canadian uh, unity. But what happened is that the Supreme Court of Canada actually produced a rather nuanced uh, opinion, uh, something that nobody actually uh, was for, for, for seeing forthcoming, uh, and both independentist and federalist or unionist in Canada found their decision pretty nuanced, pretty balanced, pretty interesting. In their decision, the court said basically, if we, if we look at the Canadian constitutional text, uh, we cannot answer your question. There's nothing about this. And in Canadian constitutional law, that means that if it's not written in the constitution, it doesn't mean that it's allowed. Uh, because you need to look into other issues. Uh, Canada having a constitution similar in principle to that of the United Kingdom, it makes it that Canadian constitutional order is made up of both formal texts, there are about 36 constitutional texts, but also you need to look into the jurisprudence by the Supreme Court of Canada, you need to look into constitutional conventions and so on and so forth. And so what they decided to do is to be quite imaginative. They say, we cannot answer your question looking at the constitution itself. So what we're going to do is that we're going to invent uh, what they call Canada's underlying constitutional principles. They say, we need to look at these principles. Actually, I have a quote here. So in our view, it is not possible to answer the questions that have been put to us without a consideration of a number of underlying principles. An exploration of the meaning and nature of these underlying principles is not merely of academic interest. On the contrary, such an exploration is of immense practical utility. Only once those underlying principles have been examined and delineated may a considered response to the questions we, ha we are required to answer emerge. So that's the very beginning of their decision. And these principles are the following, federalism, democracy, constitutionalism and the rule of law and respect for minorities. These are all principles that if you open 
one of the main constitutional texts in Canada, for instance, uh, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom or the British North America Act of 1867, you're not going to find any of these principles listed as part of Canada's core uh, constitutional architecture. One question already. The Supreme Court member are not elected, they are uh, selected by the Governor General, so the representative of the King now uh, in Canada, under the advice of the Minister of Justice, under the specific advice of the Prime Minister, meaning that in concrete terms, the nine federal judges are appointed or nominated by the federal Prime Minister with no uh, consideration whatsoever for provinces' uh, wishes. So it's a unilateral move by the federal executive. Um, so they've identified these four constitutional principles, and they even said that these principles inform and sustain the constitutional text. They are the vital, unstated assumptions upon which the text is based. Now, question you might have is, how are these defined? Because decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada are pretty long. This one is about 100 pages long, and they're pretty philosophical in their uh, the, the, the presentation of their their, their 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 ruling so how are these uh defined well glad uh you asked so i'll just go through these real quickly with you before i can finally start working on the puzzle i'm interested with you here today uh the first principle about federalism the, the, the court even says that federalism should be understood as the lodestar to by which the courts have been guided throughout their interpretation of the canadian constitution uh they refer to federalism as uh, meaning a pactist tradition where uh, provinces and the central government are meant to be uh, partners, uh, where none is formally subordinated to one another, so they're equal in principle. Uh, they also say that the principle of federalism specifically is meant to help managing diversity, cultural diversity, and to provide significant autonomy for provincial governments to develop their societies and to facilitate the pursuit of uh, collective goals. Uh, when they come to present democracy, uh, they connected intrinsically to the principle of federalism. So democracy and federalism must be understood uh, and read hand in hand. So the principle of democracy, they say, is fundamentally connected to what they call substantive goals. Uh, they need to promote the uh, self-government, then accommodate cultural groups such as Quebec. And they say something very important for the rest of the discussion. They say, and I quote, in Canada, there may be different and equally legitimate majorities in different provinces and territories and at the federal level. No one majority is more or less legitimate than the others as an expression of democratic opinion. So by saying this, the Supreme Court of Canada kind of identify Quebec, for instance, as a political body of its own, as a demos uh, that can produce a democratic majority that would be just as legitimate as the democratic majority than the whole of Canada. Uh, pretty important for the following uh, discussion. Uh, when they do present the principles of constitutionalism and the rule of law, uh, quite simply, the rule of law, it's the idea that there's only one rule for all, nobody's above the law. They also stresses that the idea of the rule of law is to vouchsafe, vouchsafe for, uh, to the citizens and residents of the country a stable, predictable, and ordered society in which to conduct uh, their, their affairs. It provides a shield for individuals from arbitrary state action. And when they talk about constitutionalism, it's simply about the idea that it requires that all government action comply with the constitution. And finally, the principle for respect for minorities, it relates to all these constitutional provisions to protect minority language, religion, and educational uh, rights. And they also connect protection for minorities with treaty rights for indigenous peoples uh, in Canada. Now, coming back to uh, the questions that um, our Prime Minister, uh, Jean Chrétien, asked the Supreme Court in 1996, the three questions here, if Quebec can secede under uh, domestic law and under international law. Um, the Supreme Court of Canada produced this opinion, and I quote, the federalism principle in conjunction with the democratic principle dictates that the clear repudiation of the existing constitutional order and the clear expression of the desire to pursue secession by the population of a province would give rise to a reciprocal obligation on all parties to confederation to negotiate constitutional changes to respond to that desire. 
And so if I'm to put this in a nutshell, they say a clear question, a clear answer to that question leads to a duty to negotiate, which would then lead to a formal constitutional change. And taken together, these represent the four conditions to meet if Quebec is to pursue secession in a legal and legitimate way in Canada. This has been received as very nuanced opinion because both independentists and unionists could see something they like. Independentists say the Supreme Court of Canada actually identified a legal path for us to secede. The unionists said, well, looking at the duty to negotiate and formal constitutional change, they say that we need to negotiate. They don't say we need to achieve anything out of these negotiations. So it's not so bad. Quebec won't be able to secede after all. But people in Ottawa, federal elites, were still not so happy with this because it was too nuanced an opinion, specifically Jean Chrétien, who felt the need, the urge to preserve Canadian unity. And here he saw a, a slim possibility for Quebec independentists to actually secede. And so what he did, his government, who held a, on a majority uh, government, therefore they controlled the majority of seats in the Canadian Parliament at that point, uh, they say the reference race secession of Canada of Quebec, so the Supreme Court of, of Canada's opinion, we need to interpret this. We need to clarify some of the issues that it contains so that there's no ambiguity whatsoever with what this would mean in any future scenario if Quebec was to secede again or try to secede again. So it's even called an act to give effect to the requirement for clarity as set out in the opinion of the Supreme Court of Canada in the Quebec secession reference. The Clarity Act claims, therefore, to possess the virtue of clarifying the court's 1998 uh, reference. The three questions that I asked myself, which is at the, the, the puzzle I'm in, interested with, and this is what we're going to discuss for the rest of my presentation, are the following. The first one, is the act compliant with the normative framework presented by the Supreme Court of Canada in the 1998 reference session? Otherwise put, are the provisions of the Clarity Act compliant with the four underlying constitutional principles the Supreme Court of Canada said are crucial to provide any clear answer to these very tough questions. Second question, is the act, the Clarity Act, actually clarifying anything? And third, should it serve as an inspiration for other multinational democracies? You can think of any cases you may want to uh, reflect upon these uh, issues. And to do so, to do so, I will actually look. I tried to look at the act, which is a small act. It, 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 it's on four pages, uh, basically. I've identified what I believe are the six main characteristics of the Clarity Act. And I will contrast these uh, with the four underlying constitutional principles and will contrast this with whether it actually clarifies anything or not. So. The first, the first characteristic is the clarity of the question. Uh, it's about the House of Commons, therefore the uh, elected House of the Canadian Parliament, giving itself the power to uh, assess whether a referendum question is clear enough and to do so before people could vote on it. And therefore here, the House of Commons gives itself the right to, uh, within 30 days, uh, 30 days after, for instance, the Quebec Assemblée Nationale would have tabled a referendum question to say whether they consider this to be clear or not. And if they decide it's not clear enough, they would ask the Quebec National Assembly to revise the framing of their question and so on and so forth until there is an agreement on the clarity of the question. Characteristic number two, it's about the no third option clause. Basically, the Clarity Act made it obvious that only a question concerning secession would be considered clear. Therefore, no third option, more autonomy, Devo Max, or whatever you might think of, could be included in the framing of a question for this to be considered a clear question by the House of Commons. Therefore, uh, if a question merely focuses on a mandate to negotiate, which was something included in the 1980 referendum, something very broad, very hard to understand, say this wouldn't be considered clear enough. Uh, it needs to be explicitly about you seceding. And it cannot be about other possibilities, more autonomy, for instance. The third characteristic is about assessing what would be a clear result. Pretty important if you want to clarify this issue. And so the, the House of Commons, what it does here is that it gives itself the authority to wait 
until after the votes are counted to state what it would consider to be a clear result. And they specify this at section two, subsection one and two of the Clarity Act that they would consider both the size of the majority of valid votes uh, cast, uh, the percentage of eligible voters that actually voted, and any other matters that they would consider to be of matter here. The fourth characteristic is the duty to negotiate. The federal parliament interpreted the Supreme Courts of Canada's decision duty to negotiate logic by stating that not only the federal government would need to negotiate, but these negotiations would include as well uh, other member states or so the other provinces, it, as well as indigenous peoples uh, of Canada. So they would all be part of these negotiation processes. The fifth clause, the override clause, it's about uh, the Clarity Act making clear that Ottawa, the federal parliament, could override a vote in favor of secession if it considers that any aspect of the act have been violated. This is presented in section three, subsection one of the Clarity Act. And finally, the form, formal um, uh, requirement to amend the constitution for all this to take action, to take effect. So the act provides that an amendment to the constitution would be required to allow secession of a province of Quebec, for instance. Now, if I'm to recap all this, are these compliant with the underlying constitutional principles that I presented to you earlier, federalism, democracy, constitutionalism, and the rule of law, as well as protection for minorities? Uh, my assessment is that there are three provisions that are par perfectly uh, compliant with this framework. They don't pause, they don't cause any issue here. The no third option, if you want to clarify anything here, I think it's only fair, reasonable to say that it needs to be a question specifically on secession, not on something else. The duty to negotiate, uh, well, if you are in favor of the principle of protection for minorities, including indigenous people, if you are in favor of federalism where provinces and the central state are equal partners, it makes all the sense to include all these partners into the negotiation process and a formal amendment required, this is only in line with the principle of constitutionalism and the rule of law. However, the two, the three other principles are more problematic. I believe that one of these principles, the first one, the clarity of the question is mildly problematic from the perspective of uh, federalism uh, and uh, principles number three and five are clearly problematic, both from the perspective of federalism, democracy, and constitutionalism, and the rule of law. And so I'll try to make my case in front of you over the next few uh, minutes. How am I doing with the time? Uh, still good? Excellent. So the first characteristic, the clarity of the question. I say it's a mild federal deficit because what the federal parliament does here is that it gives itself the power to unilaterally dictate to Quebec, for instance, whether they consider their question to be clear. Uh, they will do so after the Quebec National Assembly would have tabled a question. Here, I say it's only a mild federal deficit because in doing so, one partner appears to be more important than the other. The federal partner can uh, instill a dialogue here to say, no, I believe your question is not clear enough, but it's only a mild deficit because the provincial order of government still have time after that to revise the question in itself, and therefore a form of dialogue would be in motion. But as constitutional scholar Stephen Tierney wrote, the Supreme Court of Canada confirmed that the determination of the question's clarity was to be left to political actors, but the court did not in any way suggest that this issue should be resolved exclusively by actors at the federal level. Therefore, I understand this to be of meaning a mild deficit related to the federalism uh, principles. The other two ones are much more uh, important, I would say. So the third characteristic assessing what is a clear result. I recall that the federal government gave itself the power to wait until after the votes are counted to, the, to, to, to say what they would consider a clear result to be. And I argue that this goes against both the democratic and the federal uh, principles. Looking at the federal principles first, uh, one needs to remember that according to the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, there may be different and equally legitimate majorities in different provinces and territory and that no one majority should be considered more legitimate than the other as the expression of a democratic opinion. Therefore, in this process, you clearly have one majority that, ha that has been elected at the federal parliament that has more power than the other. 
I was walking by the uh, George Orwell Square the other, way, the other day, and I thought of this famous uh, quote from Animal Farms that all animals are made equals, but some animals are more equals than others. I think it's fair to say that this goes into that direction. You say, yeah, you two are equal partners, but one of the partner can wait after the game has been played to say what they would consider to be a clear uh, result. But also from a federalism perspective, it's pretty problematic to say that you could wait until after the votes are counted to say, well, you reach 59%, but we would consider a clear result only to be of 60%. But imagine the scenario where you would have 64% and the federal parliament could say, actually, we had in mind more 65%. But looking at the Clarity Act, they can also say the turnout is actually 1% under the threshold we had identified. Uh, we believe that 93% was required and there was a turnout of 92 uh, and so on and so forth. And therefore, it breaks the power relation that are supposed to be composed of two equal partners in state in status, where one partner clearly have more power uh, to dominate the other in this constitutional uh, dialogue. The, five, the, the fifth characteristic that is also very problematic is the override clause. I think it's pretty uh, easy to understand why it is uh, a deficit in terms of both federalism and democracy. If you can consider that any aspects of the act have been violated and you don't need to say what indicators you would use to say that has been violated. Well, for the same reason I just expressed, you could say from a democratic and federal perspective, it's pretty uh, in, in, in break, in rupture with these uh, principles. But also with the logic of constitutionalism, as uh, the uh, federal parliament gave itself the power to actually both act as party and judge to adapt the rules of the game to the changing political environment, as you can wait until after the votes are counted to change your political argumentation, then you can always make sure that you're going to win. So I would say that this is precisely a reflection of Jean Chrétien's political motivation to make sure to interpret the Supreme Court of Canada that had been identified as being too nuanced in a way that would clearly benefit the federal order of government at the expense of the provincial order of government in an attempt to secede from uh, Canada. So if I'm to recap all this once again, and now ask myself whether this actually clarified anything comparing the Clarity Act with the Supreme Court of Canada's uh, decision in 1998, I would say that they did clarify at least two issues, that no third option would be deemed acceptable, so no question including more autonomy, Devo Max, or something else, and that uh, the uh, duty to negotiate would include indigenous peoples as well as other member states of the federation, not only the federal order of government. Fair enough. But looking at the most important issue, characteristic number three here, what would be considered a clear result? The federal parliament actually did exactly the contrary. They didn't clarify at all what would be considered a clear result. They only said that they would keep the power to wait until after the votes are counted to assess what they considered at that moment to be a clear result. And therefore, they actually made this a lot less clear than it was already with the Supreme Court of Canada, where you could interpret this to mean 50% plus one vote would mean a clear result. Now, if they were to say a substantial majority is required, 60% is required, Fair enough. If you want to play by these rules, let's play by these rules. But if you can change these in light of the result that have already been casted, I think that it's pretty uh, unclear in terms of uh, the result of the Clarity Act here. As part of my concluding remarks now, that hopefully can serve to enlighten other multinational democracies that are dealing with these issues. Uh, for instance, if I was working on uh, a committee that has a, the job to, uh, to reflect upon these issues, uh, not pointing anybody in particular in this room, of course. Uh, well, the first concluding remark that I would have is that clarity can serve the status quo and favor the center. When we look at the Quebec Canadian experience, wanting to clarify these vague constitutional issues can produce results that go against the interest of the minority nation. Quebec in this case, and not only with the Clarity Act, but also with an under, another decision that has been rendered by the Supreme Court of Canada in 1981 uh, during the patriation process where Canada patriated its constitution from London. Uh, many times over the 20th century, uh, 
partners in Canada tried to change their constitution. It failed all the times because Quebec refused the uh, amendment at some point. And therefore, all partners were under the impression that Quebec enjoyed a veto power over constitutional provision. At least that all provinces had a veto power and therefore Quebec had won over this issue. In 1980, Quebec refused, 1981, Quebec refused the constitutional uh, amendment proposition and it went on anyway. And the Supreme Court of Canada confirmed that what everybody presumed existed in the Canadian Federation, a veto right for Quebec, was only a futile constitutional convention that had no more power today. And therefore, they contributed to clarify the situation at the expense of the minority nation here in this issue. Second remark, it's about the value of ambiguity of what has been called constitutional abeyances. And uh, I was reading back some chapters of this book by uh, David Thomas, uh, Whistling Past the Graveyard, uh, Constitutionalism, Constitutional Amendment, Quebec and Future of Canada, uh, a book published actually in 1997, only a few months before the Supreme Court of Canada's decision and the Clarity Act. And it's very interesting to read this book knowing that he wrote this just a few months before this happened. And he talks about uh, these constitutional abeyances, the idea that in a constitutional order such as uh, Canada, uh, but you can think of the case of Spain, for instance, there are some issues that are not clear looking at a constitutional text. And he made the argument that one is better off leaving these in abeyances, because if you want to clarify to make sure everybody's on the same page, you might actually bring more tensions to the table than to manage these, whereas if it's unclear, you can have two partners interpreting these constitutional provisions in a differentiated way. Uh, now, I think this can work into some circumstances, but in a constitutional order that has been working over the past two decades, uh, systematically at the expense of recognizing one's autonomy and uh, empowering uh, its institutional framework. Uh, I think it needs to be said that constitutional abeyances can also play both in favor of the center and of uh, minority nations. So my point here would be that you need not to be obsessed with clarity, uh, because if you are obsessed with clarity, it can lead to uh, strengthening the power relations in favor of the center rather than the minority nation, but maintaining everything in abeyances might also simply uh, retard the debate at some future point. So you might not solve anything, but you might gain some time uh, in doing so. In doing so, you need to understand both strategies and how they can play out. If I was to uh, organize an opinion to suggest a minority nation's uh, regional government how to deal with this issue, surely I would look into the framework of the reference race secession of Quebec as something of great value. Uh, first of all, the Supreme Court of Canada enjoys a very positive reputation worldwide in terms of the, what their opinion means, and they have already been cited by the Spanish Constitution, uh, the Tri Tribunal Constitutional, as well by uh, judges of other Supreme Courts, and therefore I would look into this and see, well, the four underlying principles that they identified, federalism, democracy, constitution, Institutionalism and protection for minorities, this is very valuable to think of how we should resolve and manage tensions in multinational democracies. But I would refrain to look too much into the Canadian Clarity Act as an example, because clearly this has led to uh, greater tensions and to uh, discontent between Quebec independentists and nationalists more broadly and uh, unionists. So I think that in doing so, I would make sure to connect more the focus of this enterprise with the reference race secession of, of Quebec, the court's opinion, than the Clarity Act, which is a bill by uh, the uh, Canadian federal order. Therefore, I will conclude simply by stressing that one needs to be cautious when using the political grammar and legal grammar of the Clarity Act because of the precedent of the Quebec Canadian experience. That being said, you cannot put back the genie in its bottle when it's out already. So if you're in a context where people already began talking about the Clarity Act, I'm not saying that you should stop talking about this altogether. You will create more uh, public opinion. People will have a 
uh, changing opinion about this because it will be changing the wordings. Uh, but simply that as you talk about clarity, I think it's much more interesting to look into the Supreme Court of Canada's opinion than the federal bill uh, per se. So I will conclude here. Thank you very much. Veronica, and I guess now I pass the mic and I answer on this. Excellent. Thank you, Felix. That was very, very interesting. I wanted to ask you, what did the Clary Act or Clarity provisions look like in the case of Scotland? You have not mentioned Scotland in the entire talk. <laughs> maybe for a reason? Yeah. yeah I'm happy. Oh, yeah. I'm happy you, you yeah. I'll take it, sure, maybe. Yes. So that's, that's my only question, and, and, yeah, and thank you for a very, very good talk. Thank you. Actually, I hope that someone would be asking this uh, specific question. Uh, it's very interesting because the Supreme Court, uh, the United Kingdom Supreme Court, in their uh, decision regarding uh, Scotland, what they did is that they cited the Supreme Court of Canada's uh, reference with the session of Quebec, but they actually referred to the wordings of the Clarity Act. Now, I believe this is probably the error of a clerk within uh, the whole administration, but they misquoted the reference race secession of Quebec, and they actually said that the reference race secession of Quebec was the same thing than the Clarity Act, which are two different issues. And this is very problematic, to my opinion, because in the uh, logic of the Canadian constitutional order, a decision by the Supreme Court of Canada has much more normative value than a simple ordinary law adopted by a simple majority by the federal parliament. And therefore it's pretty problematic, but because as they use the uh, Canadian experience, the, uh, the, the, the British uh, tribunal, they actually use this as an argument to limit uh, Scotland's ability to move on with another uh, vote on, on independence, rather than to look at what the Supreme Court actually said in the reference race secession of Quebec, which didn't say anything about timeline. So this is the one issue that has that is very different from the United Kingdom debate that has to do with a certain amount of number of years that need to pass before you can organize another referendum. In Quebec, this was never uh, an issue. Uh, Quebec organized two referendums, but there were also other referendums in the early 1990s that were organized on this issue. And uh, you, do you think that it also hurt? The, so uh, I guess I'm not, a, I'm not a, and constitutionalist, I'm not a legal scholar, I'm not a you know political philosopher like you, but it would seem to me that if they come to the referendum having agreed on something, uh, do we still establish, I guess agreement doesn't prevent disadvantage. Right? Yeah. People can agree and be in disadvantage, right? But uh, where does it end? Like, um, how do you reach those provisions in a way that pre predicts that there will not be this disadvantage? It seems that it's a philosophical question, I know, but yeah, no, you see what I'm going. Absolutely. Uh, so, so the the decision by the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom uh, has to be distinguished with the agreement, political agreement that had been agreed upon between uh, uh, Edinburgh and, and London, where they agreed on the wordings of a specific question, on the modalities, on the uh, what would be considered a clear result before going into this. And in doing so, uh, there was no formal document in which they uh, said we got inspiration from uh, the Canadian case. Uh, in some public discourses, yes, political elites referred to the Supreme Court of Canada's decision. And in that process, so that must have been in 2014, I guess, uh, 12. The 12, 2012, the agreement, thank you, Mark, for uh, <laughs> giving me the right answer here. Uh, they actually produced some clarity that favored, uh, I, I would say, equal partnership in this constitutional debate. So I would say that the 2012 clarity agreement between Edinburgh and London was of great value for any future uh, political enterprises that would want to clarify this, because in doing so, they've agreed on specific principles to live by whenever they would organize this. And it was mutually agreed upon by both parties. There were no one party subordinating the other one in this uh, process. Uh, thanks, Felix, for the very interesting presentation. And I, I, have a, I have a couple of questions related to the, to the elements that define this, 
when they define these underlying con con constitutional principles and they define these different provisions or elements that would that would you know signify that that, that some clarity was provided these four factors of clarity right the the duty to negotiate the clear question so on and so forth the first one is whether there was implicitly or not or said in any point that there was some kind of hierarchy uh so there was an ordering in the importance of these elements especially in the underlying ones uh the, the underlying constitutional ones there was none of those and then in the clarity ones because i think that for the first one, it's pretty important to establish that whether federalism was put the first one for some reason in, in order to define and clarify what that may, meant, uh, there was some value then on how that could contradict some of the elements that democracy may entail in the definition of, 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 of then what would what that would entail then for the for the clarity in terms of potential referendum or negotiation. And in the end, what I think it's kind of uh, and also my question is based on the many conversations that I've had with Mark on this on the on whether the clarity and, and in here I'm asking you as a, as a political thinker, someone who knows more, a lot about this is like whether the clarity that we need is in a theory of negotiation. What entails here negotiating something when when we have one of the parties in here which is structurally weaker and and by definition has a, a, a lower level of of getting power because in this clarity and the underlying constitutional principles they were setting initially a, a logic that no one has a lower bargaining power because we are kind of talking about non subordination equal partners so on and so forth okay then reinforce that with the democratic principles so they say what well, those are the patterns of negotiation that would mean something in terms of a clear negotiation mm -hmm. but then when the clarity act uh, approved by the parliament passes that invalidates completely those principles it establishes a unilateral capacity for vetoing certain positions or even for exposed for interpreting how the results are valid or not and my key question is whether what would be the elements for a theory of negotiation in this context that we needed what are the elements that would mean that there is a meaningful negotiation about these situations that includes no veto power or not that takes into account the unbalance of power that exists between two parties and then, then a meaningful agreement building on I was saying yeah that would be actually be rich yeah, and if that is possible at all yeah. real power relations uh in the yeah so uh, for, for, for first first question uh about the hierarchy of constitutional principles uh it's crucial to understand that within the logic of the Canadian constitutional order there are no constitutional principle that is more fundamental or fundamental vis-a-vis -vis the other uh all constitutional provisions are said to be of equal value of equi primordial value to use the specific wording of the Supreme Court of Canada when they presented federalism democracy etc cetera, etc cetera, they said this is a non exhaustive list and no one principle should trump the other they should all be balanced to produce a uh, balanced opinion in the end uh, in their opinion also when they identified the four conditions to be met for a successful enterprise seceding enterprise to 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 uh to happen uh they didn't specify that one of the conditions was more important than the other they rather said that they are all of equal value now you are absolutely correct though in your assessment of how the clarity act reversed this they attempt to put some conditions being more important than the other the clear result that this, the, the, the federal parliament could decide upon after the votes are, are counted. And I didn't go there, but I believe that this situation happens in the future. Uh, we'll see, but for the moment, there's no independentist movement that has a strength similar to what was going on in the 1990s. But if this was to happen in the future and the federal government was trying to use the Clarity Act, I'm pretty certain that this would have would be challenged in front of the Supreme Court of Canada itself. And as it disconnect with its own opinion of the Supreme Court, I believe that there are fair chances that the Clarity Act would be deemed unconstitutional on that nature, but it hasn't been challenged uh, yet. Uh, now, is there a theory of negotiation that can emerge out of all this? Uh, looking at the Supreme Court of Canada itself, it's not much of a theory of negotiation than what they call a duty to negotiate and they don't identify they they don't identify any specific criteria to follow to conduct these uh, negotiations so they left this completely open to political actors themselves now is there a theory of how should we be dealing with this there are actually a 
plurality of theories that exist. There are the theory of the just cause. You say you need to have been harmed in a very specific way for you to be uh, legitimate in asking uh, uh, to, to asking remedial uh, treatment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are more liberal uh, approaches to that. Mark also uh, developed a very interesting perspective in uh, Nations and Nationalism article, a theory of uh, realism, uh, and I think that Mark's approach on this pretty much connect to uh, some of the conclusion of the Supreme Court of, of Canada here to say, you need to think of these issues under real life power relations that are ongoing in a specific case. You should not start from uh, the presumption that there exists an ideal world in which this condition, this condition will be met. Rather, you need to look into the value of the arguments that are being promoted by political actors at a specific moment and how these power relations play out. So I would say that if there is a promising theory of uh, negotiation out of this, uh, it would look something that I would believe is of value, a much more like Mach's approach to a realism, a realist approach to all this, rather than framing your theory in a specific theoretical approach, because no single cases perfectly match the, uh, the theoretical approach. So I believe that looking at how power relations evolve uh, is a better way to hopefully arrive at good negotiations. Thank you for the excellent uh, present presentation. I think it's it's uh, very difficult to to have a, a so timely and relevant research question like those. So, uh, so my comment is uh, a, a friendly and provocative comment. I guess uh, I'm a I'm a positivist researcher, um, and I don't feel very comfortable with with your uh, with your empirical assessment because at the end of the day, it seems that your assessment depends on uh, your assumptions on your interpretation of this story, which is perfectly fine. But, but my comment is that I would like to see the null hypothesis we have to reject in order to reach the conclusion. Uh, for instance, when, when discussing whether the result is clear or not, why not performing a lab experiment in order to see what people think about this issue? Uh, so uh, I guess that my, my comment is put for thought in the idea of trying to to, to have a, a, a stronger dialogue between, between disciplines, which is a different approach. But uh, to be honest, maybe it's my own bias. Too, but uh, I don't feel very comfortable with the, with your compression because it seems to me that it's, uh, it depends on your assumptions. Thank you. Of course, oh, I was pretty close to the mic here. Uh, thank you uh, for 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 your uh, question. Not not so provocative. It's pretty uh, pretty uh, fair to ask. Actually, uh, this uh, research I presented here today uh, is based on normative assumptions that are those of the Supreme Court of Canada. So what I tried to do is to say, I'll take the Supreme Court of Canada's argument as seriously as I can. I'll say, this is what they say should be uh, guiding negotiation and this whole process. And I will contrast the Supreme Court of Canada's rationale, normative rationale, with a specific uh, bill adopted by the federal parliament in, in Canada here. So the empirical assessment is tightly connected to a normative or foundation that is that of the Supreme Court of Canada that I tried my best to present here to use as an analytical framework. So it's pretty far from a positivistic uh, approach, uh, empirically speaking here, and I wouldn't try to argue other way uh, with you here. I think it's hard though to imagine how can we deal with this kind of issue from a more uh, experimental uh, approach. For one thing, it would be highly unethical to put people in the imagined scenario where they would be dealing with these issues. There are ways to circumvent this, of course, and to uh, use real life uh, uh, scenarios and to compare, historically speaking, how it played out in one context with another. Uh, this really what was above the scope of what I intended to do here. Uh, that being said, if you find or have some insights into how this could be 
attempted. I would be very much interested to hearing your advice on this because I don't, I cannot see myself right now. How could this be done? But I think it's a very interesting uh, question. Maybe you and Andre Blair, your friend from uh, Montreal, could try to work on this. Yeah, uh, thank you, Felix. Uh, su super interesting. Uh, my apologies because I was late, so feel free not to to answer some of the questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, I had the meeting. Uh, no, the, the first question is is about the process. So obviously, a clarity process or clarity act cannot deal with everything, and I, I understand that they may mainly deal with the question and then some 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 issues here and there. But what about the process? What about like was it ever discussed the amount of money that each side uh, had to had to spend in order to like uh, uh, you know campaign in favor or against the, the the position? Because you know there are uh, distributional consequences related to like these power relations, right? So was it part ever of the clarity act? More, more of a curiosity rather than a question. The second one, which is actually connected to Nacho's point, is um, I was wondering all the time what does it mean for a question to be clear, right? Um, was it uh, was was there ever a discussion on these committees on, or in these meetings to involve like linguists, psychologists, to sort of have more? I'm sorry to put myself the Taliban hat now. Evidence based approach of what what does it mean for a question to be clear? Because that that could be done, no? We could have experimental approaches, for example, to see whether. People see more clearly some questions than others. What do, we, do they understand? Critical theory, even to see like how they interpret some some concepts. Uh, then third point, uh, easy uh, knowing states uh, isn't it, isn't a scenario uh, a plausible scenario that uh, in in the future if they see that uh, Quebec uh, is likely to secede because the polls predict a big majority, they simply change uh, the Clarity Act. Full stop. Uh, wouldn't that be like? A, pos a plausible scenario because now you have something to change, no? So it favors the status quo as well, in a, in a way. And the final question: you ended uh, saying that uh, sort of like that that the Clarity Act is not an example, but mm, provocative, uh, provocative question for you: is is it isn't it better to have one rather than to have none? Uh, sorry, you repeat the last is it, one. Isn't it better to have one, even if it's this one, rather than having none, having no Clarity Act, even if it's imperfect? I mean. Excellent. I will do my best to answer all four questions, even though, uh, Tony, you are I played. That's absolutely uh, fine, of course. Uh, first question uh, about the process. Um, if there are, for instance, specific issues related to electoral expenses, nothing in the Clarity Act. The easy uh, reason to understand this is because this has already been regulated by a plurality of other uh, provisions of, of other uh, bills related to party expenses and um, political actors expenses both in uh, referendum campaigns which are uh, regulated by uh, both provincial and federal laws as there have been a variety of referendums in Canada from prohibition to uh, Quebec secession movement to a, a proposition in 1992 to revise the Canadian constitutional order. So this has not been dealt with by the Clarity Act because it's already there at another place. And it's, uh, not, it's a non-political issue. People are pretty happy. The rules of the game have been set pretty clear. Uh, they limit the expense of each side, uh, the time that you can use on public uh, televisions and public radio, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not included in Clarity Act only because it's already there at another place. Um, what would be a clear question? So this issue uh, really uh, comes out of the experience we have in 1995, the question made 36 words. It was a whole paragraph. And there were many, many jokes to be made with that because people were saying to read the question. And at the end, they didn't know if they should say yes or no. They didn't know actually what answer they should have selected because it was too complex. It was in 1995, it was about, do you agree uh, following the agreement reached between the uh, Quebec government and the federal government on June 5, uh, 1994, uh, to start a negotiation process. Et so it was so long that they came at the end. It's like, uh, I'm in favor, I'm against uh, secession. What should I say? So that really is the issue with this. Now, the Parti Québécois, the main independent, is the, the, the most important independentist party in Quebec politics so far, uh, they 
themselves agreed in 2004, I think under some internal uh, Congress, that next time, presuming there would be a next time in, in, in their opinion, uh, the question would be very simple. Uh, do you believe Quebec should be an independent country? Exactly the same phrasing that uh, the Scots use, uh, the Scots, Scottish independentist uh, movement and referendum. So that was uh, the reason why we had these uh, debates. Now, uh, if change in public opinions were to occur. Now it's about 33% are in favor of the independence of Quebec. It has been pretty steady over the past 20 years. Uh, it reached in some uh, public opinions in the 1990s, 1993, 1994, over 60% from, from, from specific uh, standpoint. If it were to change again, uh, the federal parliament could absolutely uh, revise the Clarity Act. It's an ordinary law, therefore it only needs one uh, cabinet minister that wants to, uh, to, 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 to propose a, an amendment to the bill, and it could be done basically in two weeks uh, if they want to achieve this. Now, if it's a conservative government, because in at the federal level, we've only had federal, uh, liberal, and conservative uh, parties in power. Uh, if it's a conservative uh, government, I would say that over the past 20 years, uh, since Stephen Harper, this party has been more inclined to grant uh, autonomy and a distinct status to Quebec than the Liberal Party. And so I would presume that the uh, a federal government under the leadership of the conservative would try not to offend Quebec and the independentists with the hope that they would gain their trust and that they would vote for them at a federal level, saying that federalism can be reformed in Canada, trust us. Uh, the liberal though has been have used uh, various strategies to uh, provoke Quebec independentist movement in a variety of tug of institutional wars between these two uh, parties. So I would say that they might be inclined to do so uh, at some point, but they could do so pretty easily. I don't know what would be the political motivation and the political gains to change this, however. Uh, and finally, is it better to have a Clarity Act or not? Uh, Again, here we need to have experiments to very uh, to, to to come with a clear answer uh, to this uh, clear question. Uh, I, I would say that it depends. Uh, context matters here. Uh, looking at the Quebec Canadian case, uh, there were two referendums organized in 1980, 1995. They were conducted uh, in a democratic way. They went very smoothly, and there was no Clarity Act. And it was already presumed that political actors would need to negotiate after the votes uh, have been counted if there is a winning side. And people worked under the presumption that 50% plus one vote was the threshold to obtain. Now, if this is being contested in public debates, you might want to have a clarity act to say what is the threshold at what turnout you need to reach for this decision to be meaningful, politically speaking, uh, I think this would ease up the possibility for a winning referendum by a minority nation to gain international recognition, which in the end is what matters most for a minority nation to gain independence if that's the wish of said minority nation. So I would say that it depends on the context, on the real life political uh, power relations that are in motion, uh, but I wouldn't say that you need absolutely a clarity act if political actors already agree on some basic guidelines. Hello. Hi, uh, great presentation, very interesting topic. So I, I have a couple of questions regarding uh, the Supreme Court's uh, uh, reactions to this already, like the understanding is the decision initially uh, seemed more normative rather than uh, objective about how to deal with the secession case. Um, uh, so they, they they talk about handing over uh, the rest of the debate to polit political actors, but also realizing that in the real life scenario, there was a unionist majority uh, uh, in power and and after 81 considering that uh, Quebec's veto power was cosmetic only so there was there was not much to play there so what was the response of the Supreme Court to the Clarity Act uh, since initially it was their domain and if jurisprudence was required why did why was it not referred back to the Supreme Court uh, 
when they already knew that uh, there was uh, the unionists were in power. And uh, I'm also interested in the principles you laid down uh, from the Clarity Act. So the last one, uh, which there was a green signal to that, was that uh, even if the, the, the prior five principles passed and if there was no problem with it, uh, they, you would still require uh, an amendment to the constitution to have it passed all the way. And then in this scenario, what if still the, there was a unionist majority and if all clauses were met and then still they, they, they kind of uh, did not help it pass or did not vote uh, for the amendment, even the rest of the clauses were met. So what happens in this scenario? And overall, would you, would you consider that the Supreme Court did not want to be objective with their decision? They wanted it uh, wanted the secession case to be ambiguous uh, with abeyances uh, and so on. Uh, how do you see the role of the Supreme Court uh, during and after this Clarity Act? Thank you. Thank you, Shahal, for, for these uh, very interesting questions. Thank you for, for all this. Uh, for, first of all, my first comment would be that I would absolutely disagree that any decision of any Supreme Court can be objective. It's always highly normatively charged. A constitutional order is always uh, about power relations that have been fixed at some point and constitutions evolves, but they always reflect power relations at a given time. Uh, the Spanish constitution, 1978, it's the reflection of what happened at that point at a specific, specific critical juncture. So I think that ne this needs always to be kept in mind and that I don't believe that judges of any tribunal are objective. They are most of the time quite conservative in their assessment of cases as they most of the time want to preserve the integrity of the constitutional edifice that they are main, meant to protect. Uh, sometimes though, judges are more adventurous. They allow themselves to be more imaginative. That's what the Supreme Court of Canada did in 1998, but that's more of an exception than uh, the reality. Most of the time, so social and political changes precedes uh, constitutional uh, changes on, on that point. Um, the Supreme Court of Canada never reacted to uh, the Clarity Act uh, because they have a duty uh, to not be involved in day-to-day -day politics and also because they're all appointed by uh, the federal executive. And although in Canada, we do have a division of powers between the legislative, uh, judiciary and, and executive, it, even though in Canada, we're supposed to have this, it's more of a confusion of power because the executive is itself part of the legislative and the executive is the one that promotes the judiciary. So it's a really confused uh, system on that scale. And therefore the Supreme Court of Canada's judges won't intervene in a, an ongoing political debate unless they are explicitly asked by the federal government as they did in 1996 leading to the uh, opinion. Now, uh, you are right that the final requirement both in the Supreme Court of Canada's decision and in the Clarity Act is that there needs to be formal constitutional amendment for a secession to be effective. Uh, this can be very hard to achieve in the context of Canada since 1982. Uh, we have a new constitutional uh, amendment procedure that would imply that to reach a constitutional amendments allowing Quebec to secede, all provinces or at least seven out of 10 provinces uh, that together would compose more than 50% of the population are on board. So even though all the requirements are uh, met, it doesn't mean that a final one would necessarily pass. And that's why unionists originally, when the Supreme Court of Canada's decision uh, was released, they also uh, claimed victory because they say, even though there's a clear result, a clear question, we negotiate in the end, if we have a majority in Ottawa, we can block this. Uh, so it's, it won't happen. Uh, then this would be a matter of international uh, recognition. There would be power relations that go beyond the borders of a domestic state. And if uh, there was another cases, say France that would grant uh, recognition to Quebec, it would be it would impact how this would play out. So I think it goes beyond the scope of a simple domestic question at that point, but it's still a possibility that no formal agreement uh, is reached uh, at the end. And was there another question? Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Charles.
Thank you, Felix, for, for your talk and for, for transforming the initial topic into this <laughs> into this kind of trap. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to comment. Uh, I mean, we, we have we have time to to talk about this, and we have been talking a lot. Um, um, Felix is here for still for one month, uh, I think. So uh, he's always at at the, the office, uh, yeah, near our office, in fact, in front of the. Of the Right next to Veronica. Next, next to Veronica's office. So he's always available to discuss and to have a coffee. He has been actually very engaged into our faculty. And we are very thankful for this. Um, he has also been teaching and has been a very successful professor in this master course on current research on federalism. And we hope we continue to have to have this, this uh, intellectual and academic connection in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. And last word, uh, thank you all for being so welcoming. I've, it's been two months now that I'm here and I really uh, enjoyed my stay. You've all been very welcoming, uh, having lunch and coffee discussions. So thank you for that. And uh, hopefully these have this presentation has given food for thoughts to reflect upon ongoing uh, issues. I tried my best to stick on the Quebec Canadian uh, debate and infer what this could mean for other uh, uh, cases. Uh, of course, not being a Catalan myself, so I don't want to take part directly into uh, the debate, but I think it's very interesting to uh, be reflecting upon these issues. These are crucial issues when we think about autonomy, recognition, self-determination, which are the three pillars of any national community, any minority national community in their quest to uh, emancipate politically, collectively, culturally. So I think these are crucial uh, question and thank you for having uh, been here to discuss these issues uh, with me. So thank you.